Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. conversation and always good food here in the common room. So uh, we want to remind you uh, to be sure to bus your own tables. Um, if you have a folding chair, fold it up. Uh, it looks like maybe the bowls are compostable, but not the plates. Is that correct? Yes. yes. So the plates, there, the bins are labeled trash, the compost. So your food and the bowls can go into the compost. Uh, the infamous soapy vat is there for your utensils, and there's a tray on the table for your glasses. So if you could just help the crew by taking care of your own place, that would be awesome. Uh, are there any community announcements today? I have one for PhD students. The deadline for the Marty Center junior dissertation applications is next Wednesday, the 15th. So I sent out an email about that, but don't forget. It's mail. Um, Green at the Divinity School is doing a fun challenge, Walking Walk the Earth challenge. So all the Divinity School students are uh, welcome to partic participate. Uh, we'll give you a pedometer and you log in a certain amount of counts you have during the week and then you win fabulous prizes. So if you if you'd like to get a <laughs> pedometer, uh, let me know or Sarah know uh, or email at greendivinityschool at gmail.com and we'll get you hooked up. Thank you. And that's also for faculty and after Yes, students. for everybody in <laughs> Divinity School. Um, also on Monday, just so that you're aware, um, is our Admitted Students Day. Uh, so we will have lots of newly admitted students. Uh, there will be a PhD coffee hour at 3 o'clock right before. There's a craft of teaching session at 4, but there's also um, a DSA 4 to 8. So of course we know you will be warm and welcoming and want to share with those students why they should come and study. Uh, at the Divinity School. So it's a little later than it normally is, but uh, just be aware that we'll have lots of guests uh, floating around the building, so um, I'm sure you will be your normal hospitable self. So it's good to see you all. Uh, our speaker today uh, is Julia Parzen, who uh, works with um, an organization called Parzen Consulting, or JP Consulting. But <laughs> her, her topic today is sustainability, a framework for solving complex urban problems. Uh, she is a social entrepreneur who co-founded Working Assets, one of the first socially responsible mutual funds, uh, the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, which is a renowned network of 130 North American local government sustainability leaders, and Partners for Places, a grant fund that has helped local government and foundation partners to attract $4 million for sustainability projects. Her career in public service and sustainability has spanned public, private, publishing and nonprofit sectors, including a strong mix of strategy development and implementation. Most recently, she co-authored The Guide to Greening Cities, published by Island Press in 2014. Uh, she mentioned at the lunch table that sustainability is now getting closer uh, to what the concept was really uh, fully intended to, uh, to encompass. So without any further ado, would you welcome our speaker, Julia Parzan. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Great. So I'm really delighted to be here. I, I've been thinking about the Divinity School for the last 30 years because when I was in business school here at University of Chicago, um, one day someone came to me and said, okay, there's nobody from the business school playing women's volleyball and there's a big game coming up with the Divinity School. And I thought, well, I'm not very good, but that should be okay. It's the Divinity School. <laughs> so I want to say this was a lot of tall, very aggressive people. And it really changed how I thought about the Divinity School. <laughs> so I love business school, and you think business school, what does that have to do with sustainability? But going to University of Chicago, it was all about markets. And my first job I took was at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in, in Washington, D.C. at the time when all the market mechanisms were first being experimented with. Um, the bubble policy, emissions trading, 
how to make market systems work for the environment. And I feel like I've been working on sustainability ever since. I went from EPA to, the, to be the Deputy Director of Economic Policy for the state of California, and there I created secondary markets for solar home improvement loans and new business and industrial development companies to invest in, in renewable energy, um, always being on the wrong side of a, of a field and realizing that crossing over between fields is really what sustainability is all about. So, when I was in business school, my favorite class was cost accounting. Why would you like cost accounting? <laughs> and it's because it was all about, it was a philosophy about how to make decisions in life. Do I make or buy? Um, and sustainability is also a philosophy for how to make decisions in life. Asking how is everything connected? And how can I maximize as many things as possible at one time? How can I draw on everyone else's expertise to come up with a better solution for what I want to do? So it seems particularly apt to be making these remarks here at the university because it is so hard for universities to be cross-disciplinary, but I know the University of Chicago has made a lot of progress in the last decade in trying to do that, and that's really what I think sustainability is all about, a framework for tackling complex urban problems. So about, I was the outside project manager for the development of the Chicago Climate Action Plan, which was the first climate action plan in the United States to address both adaptation to a changing climate and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. At the time, that was kind of an unpopular thing to do. People didn't want to talk about adapting because they thought that meant um, it would draw attention away from the need to reduce emissions. But meanwhile, the climate was changing. Chicago's growing zone had already changed. Most people didn't know that. And so after that, I was invited by Chicago's chief environmental officer, who had then gone to Vancouver to be the deputy mayor for sustainability to help create a network of sustainability directors. And a network really makes sense anytime you have a new field emerging, because in a new field, there's rapid innovation and rapid discarding of failures. And so I set about, over time, building this network, learning a lot about the power of networks. And this is a map, this is my favorite visual from the network. It shows each year the connections between the members of the network. So in the first year, on average, a sustainability director regularly <coughs> communicated with or collaborated on projects with eight other people. And by um, five years later, it was more than 32 people. So we created a buzzing hive of activity that could form and then disappear over here and reform there so that it could really accelerate learning about how to do this really new work. And then um, Sadhu, who was the co-founder with me of, of working at of USDM, and um, Steve Nicholas, who had been Mayor Nichols' sustainability director in Seattle. I don't know if you've ever heard of Mayor Nichols, but he was the person who said cities have to commit to climate action and got 1,000 cities to sign the Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement. The three of us wrote this book, and basically we tried to capture the lessons for how do you really advance sustainability within local government? What I really like, I've done lots of different things. I mentioned private sector, public sector, environment, economic development. I love sustainability because it does what I really believe in. It's this philosophy of one plus one equals three. That if you think about problems from a systemic approach, if you try to tap all of the different capacities that you have within a city, you're going to get a different kind of solution. And you can see that in, in city of Houston. Do you really think about Houston as a sustainable city? I mean, Houston has not historically been so, but under the current mayor, it is changing very rapidly and, and radically, which only shows what you can do if you really have a commitment. Dubuque, our region, much smaller city, um, the mayor is out there going all over the country saying, this is a competitive advantage for me. 
I like sustainability because of what it does to conversations. Um, here's the definition that I use for some of the programs that I'm involved in. And, and the key thing about it is you can't have this conversation just talking about the environment. There's many other things besides environment, economy, and equity, but it's a nice catch-all. The main point is there are questions you have to ask in every decision about all three of these. You have to ask who's going to be better off, who's going to be worse off. You have to ask is there an opportunity here to build a new industry if we put green roofs in Chicago. You ask a whole different set of questions. Sustainability, it shakes things up when cities take it seriously because it brings in new problems. How are we going to address climate change, which is a multifaceted problem? Um, it really, most importantly, connects siloed activities. And you know, what do what institutions do over time? They compartmentalize, they develop narrow areas of expertise because you have to do that in order to really master subjects. But as you do that, you can also lose the big picture of how these things are all connected in systems. And sustainability, I've seen, can bring that back. Um, I was doing a presentation out in the Inland Empire a few weeks ago, and I, I wanted to see a really good definition of leading change. So I found this John Cotter definition, and I wanted to <laughs> compare it to what we put in the Guide to Greening Cities around how sustainability directors are changing cities um, in a way that integrates economy, environment, and equity. And I thought, you know, the words are different, but I thought, yeah, I could have written this. I, I wish I had. I'd be really famous now. <laughs> Everyone would know my name. But it's the same thing. I like to just take those words and use them. This is about leading change. Sustainability creates a structure to lead change within cities. Um, I know I was asked to talk about Chicago, too. And, and I don't know that much about Chicago. I know a lot about what Chicago is doing, but I, I'm not inside the guts of what's behind what the city is doing. But if you look at the 2015 Sustainable Chicago Plan that Mayor Emanuel adopted, um, it does bring up environment, economy, and well-being for all residents, which is kind of the way people talk about equity now, all residents. Um, but it's kind of circumscribed. So it's there. And Chicago is a leader in so many ways. I just put down on this sheet a few of the ways, you know, sixth in Energy Star buildings, eighth in energy policy and practice overall um, in cities in the United States. Um, really good on um, so many areas. Um, but I'm not quite sure I could say that city is a Chicago that's pursuing transformation through its sustainability work. But there are many cities that are. I mean, here's an example of some I would point to. So these are um, cities that have just signed on to a new 2050 Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance. Um, these are cities that are well on their way to meeting their goals for 2020 of reducing their greenhouse gas emissions by 20 to 30% community-wide but they know that that's not enough. They're trying to get to 80% by 2050, and they know it's gonna be really politically and technologically difficult. The obvious things are not gonna get us all the way there. So I would say these are cities that have really made a commitment to transformation publicly and have created a new network in order to help each other figure out how to get there. So those dots I showed you on the network maps at the beginning, those are the internal change agents. Those were the members of this network, the sustainability leaders. And early on, we did a survey to try to put together a professional development toolkit for sustainability directors. So if anyone's planning to become a sustainability director, you can look that up and it tells you, what do I really need to have in order to do this work? So we surveyed 100 city sustainability directors and came up with this. So you can see there's a lot of system stuff. Systems design, sustainability frameworks, um, program management, collaborative process. 
Um, these are change agent gifts. <coughs> And I was able to see over the years the change within the network where the network started at the time of the big recession and there was a lot of federal money for um, redevelopment and most of it was for energy efficiency. So what did sustainability directors work on? They all worked on energy efficiency because that's where the money was. But we created a fund, I helped create a fund in USDA, an innovation fund where groups of cities could come forward and say, this is what we really need to learn about now. So I just sort of put down over time. So in, in 2012, everyone started talking about equity. Sustainability that's just about greening, that actually shouldn't be called sustainability. Um, and then they started talking about sustainable economic development. And of course, part of that was you can't really get anywhere if you can't talk about cost savings and jobs. But it was also because they were seeing cities that had really successfully launched new sectors and were shifting their job base. Um, climate change adaptation, after all of the terrible weather events, that started to become a big issue. Sustainable consumption, that's a really interesting one because most of the emissions inventories that look at greenhouse gas emissions, they're supply-based inventories. They look at what you produce. They don't look at what you consume. So if you're really going to be serious about this, you're going to start asking the question, what about all the things we're consuming that we're bringing from other places? So that came up. And then the most recent new thing was smart cities. You know, we've, uh, how many of you have a smart meter in your apartment or house at this point? Raise your hand if you have a smart meter. So not very many, but Within a few years, everybody in Illinois is supposed to have a smart meter. It'll be this information about energy use by the minute, in every unit. And we have sustainability directors seeing companies going to their mayors all the time saying, we've got the next big smart city solution. But they've got the solution without the problem. So sustainability directors began to say, we have to shape this. Um, they're not political sustainability directors. Well, about a third of the cities, they're in the mayor's office, but most of them are not. But when the mayor wants to go in a direction, that's the direction you have to go to. So you can see that they are evolving very quickly in how they think about their role in cities. To me, the point I want to go back to is this idea of breaking down silos. Um, asking a different set of questions. This is the Portland plan. It's not a sustainability plan. This is the citywide <coughs> master plan. And in this current version of the master plan, the biggest um, dedicated area is equity. That's their overriding guiding principle for this plan. Um, but it's got the three E's there in their own kind of way and it changes all the conversations and who has to be the ta at the table. You don't have transportation planners doing transportation planning by themselves or the housing department. You can't do it that way when you have this kind of a framework. Just to get specific in a story, one of my favorite stories is about Green Cities Clean Waters from Philadelphia. And this is a guy um, who was in the water department not a very senior person, but he had done watershed management. And watershed management is when you organize all of the owners and users around the perimeter of a watershed and get them to plan together for the use of it. So he was already someone who knew how to do work in a collaborative way, but also thinking about it from a systems perspective. And a lot of cities got sued by the Environmental Protection Agency for not complying with water standards because of their overflow of sewer water. And most of them, like Chicago, um, do, is, do people here, do you know about Chicago's big tunnel? Raise your hand if you know about the big tunnel. So Chicago has a very big tunnel that was built for a 100-year storm, the problem being that that's now a 10-year storm. And the tunnel's not done, but it's not going to necessarily be sufficient. But Philadelphia, they were really faced with having to put in this gray tunnel cement infrastructure or thinking about another approach. And that was the cheapest approach. But this guy said, well, it's the cheapest approach if your only goal is reducing these sewer overflows. 
But what if it, what if you brought in parks and recreation, parks development? What if you brought in um, riparian reconstruction and um, water quality more generally? What if you brought in open space and urban forest? What would it look like then? And he came up with some new analytic techniques to look at the benefits of greening in all of these areas and compared that to the cost of building this hard gray infrastructure. And lo and behold, it was cheaper and the public benefits were much greater. There's a whole lot more to this story around creating a new measurement tool, a new indicator for capturing water on site. Um, many other innovations that came from it. But it's just a great example of the way sustainability champions system thinking and can bring you to different solutions than if you're just going to say, I have this problem with congestion on the road. I have to build another lane. Why do you have the congestion? Um, what else could you do? And if, you, and if you're open to that conversation, and Peter saying he you know, I read his whole systems, five fifth discipline workbook. I really loved it. It's another one of those life philosophy books for me. But the thing that I never forget is the five whys, which is this happens, why? Because of this, why? And it's a way of looking back to understand the system. It's so simple. So many things are so simple if you ask different questions. Now, Chicago, I would not say, is on the leading edge today in terms of global adoption of green infrastructure, but it was where it all kind of started. And Chicago gets a ton of credit for that. The mayor built that green roof. I don't know if you ever heard this story. You can see that the, the you know, I don't know if you know that City Hall is half the building and the other half is county. So it's the same building. And the green roof is on the city side and the gray roof is on the county side. And the mayor would go all over town saying, well, you know, the, the ambient temperature on the green side is 70 degrees, and on the county side, it's 125 degrees. Well, those guys are so hot over there. Because the, the mayor and the president of the county board didn't get along very well. <laughs> um, but, in fact, the guy who wrote the book with Sadie Johnson, he was brought to Chicago to green, you can see this picture here of a green alley, the other picture. When the city first started putting down permeable concrete, people said, that's very expensive, you can't do that. Well, first of all, it turned out that you didn't have to run sewer pipes under the, the permeable concrete. So you actually had some savings if you looked at it a little bit holistic method. But you could also say, we're, we're demonstrating the market here. We are going to create a change that can happen more broadly. And Chicago took that price from 150 down to 50 down to a completely reasonable price, a standard product. So what you see in sustainability and sustainability directors doing is providing this test bit for new approaches. Also reducing costs. A lot of people get started in Arbor, a little city, right away set up a revolving loan fund for energy savings. This was just for city energy savings. Paid for a position for a person immediately. Now they're doing a similar fund for community-wide energy of faiths. Um, and you can't do this work without drawing in lots of partners. So it's so cool that you don't have to want to draw in partners. You're just not going to get anywhere unless you do. And so you see many, many partnerships formed by sustainability directors. Here's a great example from Boston. Total greenhouse gas emissions, 100%. Commercial industrial sources, 50%. Just the top 50 CNI buildings, commercial and industrial, 30%. And I can tell you what sectors they are. So if you're going to really do something, you've got to go directly to them. This is not some pie-in-the-sky general, we're going, to, we're going to create a program and people will come and get funding. They put together a commission with CEOs from top hospitals, top real estate companies, sector working groups, and it wasn't about how are you going to help us meet the city's goal, it was how are we going to help you meet this goal. And you see examples like this all over the place. And also, 
as a way of getting things done that you just can't afford. You know, Phoenix had a new transit line going in, couldn't afford to do station sustainability plans, and developed a partnership with HUD, Arizona State University, some hospitals, and, and did it together. So, um, blah, blah, blah is the mother of invention. <laughs> Spreading authority. Um, food policy councils. Food policy councils, they're mostly volunteers. They are driving dramatic changes in food system in regions around the country. A city can really make a difference in helping a policy council like that to launch. And here's just some examples of all the things that the Cleveland um, Cuyahoga County Food Policy Coalition has accomplished. It's pretty amazing. A volunteer set of actors. And this can happen on a regional basis. I, who's heard of collective impact? It's kind of, raise your hand. So, oh, just a couple of people. Well, it's very popular right now as an approach for coordinating many, many community institutions in achieving change. And the greater Cincinnati area formed something called the Green Umbrella, using collective impact. They have gone through initiative at your food policy, um, trails, recycling, and just organized all of these actors to do the piece that they're able to do best under a common set of measurements. You know, cities, they can't do very much on their own. I love this picture from the Vancouver Greenest City Action Plan about what the city actually controls versus what the business and residential community controls. So you've got to leverage city assets. And this is an example from Providence where um, they're selling public land, but they're doing job training connect to it. They're connecting to local gardening organizations. And they've done it, and they're working with a land trust in order to preserve the land. And, and now they're doing it in another place, and another place, and another place. Chicago does have programs like this as well. And I want to go back to that point about asking questions. This is so much about asking questions. These are the Portland questions that get asked for every program before it goes forward. Are there current or historical racial disparities? Who's going to benefit from this? I mean, this is, this is a conversation you have in your living room, not one you'd expect to be going on in every meeting across a city. And um, I took this out of one of the Portland documents. They've you know, done layers of heat vulnerability, heat island, existing tree canopy, and prioritized tree plantings. Chicago did this you know, 15, 20 years ago. It had a Arizona State University come do um, infrared scanning of the whole city, and then they took census data and showed that low-income communities were areas that had the highest urban heat island and the least tree canopy, and the city of Chicago changed its tree planting policy from just putting a tree in the ground whenever one died to targeting those areas which really needed cooling. Measuring and reporting. Um, Vancouver's really good at this, Minneapolis, Portland, Seattle. People don't always want to put their dirty linen on it. Some cities, I remember in Chicago, every time the mayor did something that didn't go well, front page tribune, he hated that. I, I think that Mayor Emanuel is more open to that. He's certainly more open to open data. Um, but as I look at the Sustainability 2015 plan, it is not clear on the, the annual reports the progress that the city is making overall. It, it disappoints me what I see there. It's a set of outcomes, not a set of impacts. So just to finish, I want to say that the sustainability work, the other reason why I like it is that sustainability directors take a really long view. You need these kinds of change agents, I, I think in every institution, who get to know people in all the departments, who find opportunities, who help people to solve the problems they're trying to solve. This is a picture of Vancouver in the 1980s and then in the 2000s. And um, you can see in this picture right here that the population has gone up 75% in Vancouver and the vehicles entering downtown has gone down 25%. 
that's a radical change. Vancouver is a different city than it was 20 years earlier. And we cannot overestimate what we can achieve if we take the time, take the long view, and take a sustainability lens. So thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions. Any questions? Yeah, yeah, could you just talk a little bit more about Chicago? I mean, it seems like on one hand, recycling has just gotten off the ground in the last couple of years, while on the other hand, there was this great track record on construction of buildings. What's yeah. happened in Chicago? Recycling is a really interesting one because I've been trying to get blue carts universally in the city for 15 years. And, um, and I think there were some people who left the city because they were so frustrated. What's the value of blue carts is everybody sees them. They're a visible symbol that you're thinking about the environment. And when you're not there, it's a symbol that is just not that important. So it just wasn't a priority from a, a funding perspective. And now it's 100% done. I think they just finished putting out the last carts. And what I would say is Chicago is pretty far behind on recycling, but um, it can catch up. There are definitely cities that have made pretty radical progress. And what I would say is, what I see now is the cities that are getting to 70, 80 percent, they're doing curbside composting. That's probably not going to happen in Chicago for a very long time. So my focus is not on recycling. I look at recycling not as a success, but if I look at the big picture of all of the different areas that are critical to sustainability, I, I see a lot more successes. So I can't explain it. It just seemed like it kept coming up in budgets and it wasn't a high enough priority. So, question. Yeah, taking, taking the long view in light of the strategy and coalition building, what might you see as our role? How can, what can we do? And I mean, we in the multiple communities in this place, religious organizations, higher education in the humanities, what position might you imagine for these kinds of communities in the, the big picture of sustainability coalitions? Right. Well, because I'm doing this work now on equity and, and structural racism and sustainability, I just went to an all-day workshop um, a few weeks ago to understand some concepts a little better. And I think the set of questions that you need to ask, they are very personal and that they're completely fractile. So they're the same questions that you need to ask at every scale, the personal scale, the inter, um, the social scale, the institutional scale and, and the systemic scale. So I think that what everyone can do is to design processes where a, a more complete set of questions get asked. When the questions don't get asked, you know, the answers are not there. So if you're interested, you, you start with one question. It could be around racism. It could be around environmental impacts and say, well, in this decision, what are the opportunities to improve the environment and what we're doing? So um, that doesn't talk to you about the specific strategies, but I think if that becomes part of the culture, it's just going to become embedded in the system, which is what you really want to have happen over time. Yeah, Dan. I get just really slight, somewhat related to that. I'm just curious, based on, on what you've seen in the past or what you might hope for in the future, um, as to whether religious organizations or religious leaders have in some way been able to give a moral foundation to sustainability in a way that religion, I think, in the past has given a moral foundation to other important social movements. And um, if you have, I'm curious about what that is. And if not, do you imagine that that could be a uh, a factor in all this that maybe not seen. Right. Well, it has been a factor already. I mean, evangelical communities have been pretty vocal about climate action. I, on a very local 
um, level in Chicago, there's things like Faith in Place and Protestants for the Common Good. Um, and I think they've made progress. I mean, what's really important, you know, it's interesting because when we first started USDN, people would talk about how do you change behavior? And everybody wanted to do big, you know, campaigns. They were thinking about it like private sector, corporate marketing. But you can't do that when people, that, that helps people choose which car to buy, but not to buy a car. And so that's not the way we have seen a real shift. So what I see happening now is a lot more focus on community and bottoms up um, education and engagement and behavior change. And I think that maybe in that context, um, religious institutions are one key player, but not the only one. But I definitely have seen institutions where people have gotten involved in community gardening, and as a result of that, they've started conversations about what they eat. You kind of need that sort of exposure everywhere. So have I seen like a big impact? No, I mean, kind of disappointing in a way, but definitely out there. And I'm just trying to think, I can't remember, but there was just a big, announcement um, about, from black churches and I think it was with Green for All that does you know green jobs kind of work and they but I you know I've heard these announcements before. So my answer would be you'd think this would, could be very powerful. I believe that it has helped very much on the margin but not really moved entire organizations. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you've spoken mostly about the uh, the United States, uh, well, and Cooper, but uh, are there similar um, activities going on uh, and concepts being developed in, in uh, Europe and in Asia? Yes. Um, so, and if you saw that in the list of cities that are part of the, um, oh, yes, you did. the Carbon oh, Neutral Cities yeah. Network, you know, so C40, which was actually created by the Clinton Climate Initiative, which is like 40 of the largest cities in the world who've made a commitment to reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. They're on every continent. There's probably about 100 cities now, maybe 120. And I would say, you know, there are some ways in which European cities are very far ahead of most U.S. cities, um, but in other ways, you know, not so much. There's a fair amount of cross-pollination that goes on Globally, there's a lot of sister city kinds of activities between countries. And you know, there's just a lot that cities are learning from each other, including in those countries. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Could you give me examples of things that were <laughs> determined not to work and that have been rejected and mistakes have been avoided elsewhere by virtue of the networking? Let's see. Um, well, I, I'm not thinking right away of a, like a functional area where something didn't work, but I, but I think the biggest thing is everybody starts with engagement in the same way, in the same wrong way. And so I, I kind of mentioned that already. I think um, you know there's this fallacy that information is what changes behavior. So many, many cities spend a lot of money on providing better information. And it doesn't, I mean, the, the, the base of research is there to say it doesn't work. So you know, the, I, I helped to create this fund called Partners for Places that brings together cities and local foundations to do sustainability projects. And, and there's like a whole set of proposals that came in this cycle where they said, well, we're going to um, involve low-income communities in our city in um, community gardening or in something else. And then you look at the proposal, and there's no community organizations involved in the proposal. There hasn't really been a lot of outreach in those communities, and, and those projects don't get funded. And over time, you see less and less of them. So I think the big change is kind of like a participatory democracy kind of thing, which is people are not necessarily coming to this because they believe that's the, the ethical, religious approach to take. 
but they believe that if you really want to have sustainable change, you are going to have to really operate at a community level. So you see cities like Cleveland where every community is doing their own sustainability plan and there's a fund that the city has to support projects that come out of the community and they do leadership training in order to develop community leaders and, and you're seeing more and more cities take approaches like that and I think some of them are working. I just think it's a little bit early. I can't say for sure that it's a, a huge success. So that's the main example I can think of. And they're so specific. So for example, um, bike sharing has taken off across the country. Well, most places they made the first hour free. Um, and what happens is if you don't get a lot of tourists, you aren't going to make any money and the financial model is not sustainable. Once you've done that, you can't go back and change it. The new guys are not making the same model as the old. So I think there's thousands of examples like that where you put to, like there are cities now that are requiring all companies over a certain size to disclose energy data. And the first ones who did it thought, well, you'll disclose this energy data and people will reduce their energy use because they'll go, wow, I had no idea how much energy I was using. But there's that information fallacy again. Maybe a few will do that. But so now the next round are thinking, how do we actually structure this to get changes in action based on the information? Because guess what? It's not going to be automatic. So I think there are thousands of examples like that. But as far as the general areas to work in, um, they're all important. And that's what sustainability is really about. Is you can't just pick one. You've got to be doing all of it and figuring out how it's connected. A any other questions? OK, well, thank you very much. It was my thank pleasure you. to be here. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.